It's like taking a flight. <laughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Assalatu wassalamu anbiya wa musallin. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatih lima khulik. Wal khatri ma sabak nasrul haq bihaq. Wal hadi la suratul mustaqim wa ala alihi haq daril azim. Alhamdulillah. Welcome to another night at South Ilahi with the scholar. And tonight we are blessed uh, to have Sheikh Muhammad Ninawi. MashaAllah. May Allah preserve him. And Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa to everyone. May you be in good health and well-being. So tonight title is When There Is Allah, Why Is There Evil, Poverty and Suffering? It's one of the important lectures today for us, not only for us Muslim, for everyone who's interested in knowing Allah and their journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, uh, a bit about Shane Inouye, I would like to say about his biography before we start for those who uh, knew Shay, uh, just knew him. Shay, Dr. Muhammad al Ninawi is a Syrian American scholar and author based in Atlanta, Georgia, whose lineage is traced back to our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Al Ninawi is considered a muhaddis in addition to a PhD in Islamic sciences. He also holds a bachelor degree in microbiology from University of Illinois and a doctor of medicine degree. Mashallah, he is the founding director of Medina Institute and Seminaries, the Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies, and the charitable organization Planet Mercy globally. Medina Institute is a fully accredited higher learning institution offering degree programs in Islamic studies and is geared towards producing community leaders, thinkers and scholars. Uh, Al Ninawi is also the spiritual guide of the Al Alawi Al Husaini Ninawi Zawiya, a Shazili Rifa'i Sufi school. His latest release book is the Book of Love. A reflection book on Islam from the perspective of love. So before we for wherever you are, you can send in uh, your question for Shani Nawi pertaining to this topic at 9068706. Right, we are looking forward to it. Without further ado, we invite Shani Nawi to begin his lecture. Tafadol Yache. Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. على سيدنا محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين ورضي الله عن أزواجه وذرياته وأحبابه وأصحابه وأتباعه إلى يوم الدين وعنا معهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا وحانا وفهما في الدين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وآله في الأولين وصل على سيدنا محمد وآله في الآخرين وصل على سيدنا محمد وآله في الملأ الأعلى إلى يوم الدين وصلي على سيدنا محمد وآله حتى ترث الأرض ومن عليها وأنت خير الوارثين واجمعنا معهم ربنا وألحقنا بهم وأنت أرحم الراحمين أما بعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته I appreciate uh, your uh, initiative سيدي خالد الله تعالى bless you and bless the team uh, uh, there in Singapore, and may Allah Azza wa Jal grant us all uh, the uh, ability to say that which is pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, the whole concept of uh, when people say, uh, when there is Allah Azza wa Jal, why is there evil, poverty, and suffering? What they're trying to say is when there is Allah Azza wa Jal, why is there evil? Why is there pain? Uh, this problem is one of the most uh, baffling problems face facing many people who blindly follow uh, faith systems. 
or have not have not sort of gone through uh, the uh, experiential iman or the uh, theoretical iman as well theology uh, how can we explain uh, poverty e evil suffering in the face of a, a good and a very powerful god and uh, if the universe is meticulously designed uh, and not obviously chaotic then and must be rational as well based on wisdom and then why is evil still flourishing in it uh, why is suffering still flourishing in it why is deceit and lies still flourishing in it uh, if God is all powerful and almighty, then why does he allow devastating evil conditions to befall the lives of human beings? Why do the innocent suffer? And how can we account for the endless chain of moral and physical evils? Now, outwardly speaking, uh, one can also add to that to these questions uh, how come the just are continuous to suffer uh, con or continue to suffer while the unjust continue to prosper maybe uh, in a limited or at least in some situations uh, islam did not overlook the fact that evil is a reality uh, nor did it make light of disease, slavery, war, evil in general, or famine, or deceit, or lies, etc., all that stuff. Evil has its own rationale. It's unlike what some philosophers may think that it doesn't, evil has no rationale. Evil has its own rationale. It's a wicked rationale, that is. It's a rationale principled of fragmentation, of incoherence, of mockery, of vileness, of wickedness, of pure destruction. One may say evil is the shaitan uh, that laughs at the resolve of the logic of the believer and preys on weakening that bond and destroying it. Uh, there are some basic principles we have to talk about before we enter the subject of talking about if there is Allah, why there is evil, poverty, and suffering. And that is obviously, uh, number one, that this dimension, yani this what Al-Quran Al-Kareem calls Al-Hayat Al-Dunya, this dimension is a test, Allah Azza wa Jal said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Tabarak al-Ladhi biyadihi al-Mawtu wal-Hay al-Mulk. Afwan. Wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Al-Ladhi khalaq al-Mawt wal-Hayat liyabluwakum. He created death and life as a test in this dimension, and therefore, uh, Al-Quran al-Karim did not did tell us and give us a head start that this dimension is actually a test which means this is not a place of everlasting tranquility or permanent peacefulness this is a place of struggle and if you mistake it for a place of if you mistake in this temporary abode for a place of everlasting abode, abode uh, of of happiness and of tranquility of of peace then you've got the wrong address. So that's from the beginning. And therefore, we're asked to struggle. Now, the Quran did not say that there will be no peace in this dimension. But the Quran insists that we have to struggle to uh, bring about uh, positive results. Um, and that comes obviously down, that comes down to the original and ancient answer of how the Quran uh, told us about our existence, the human nature itself. Now, there are a couple of views about 
uh, uh, the, if you want, say, free will or the will of the human being. Some people believe in absolute free will, independent of God. You are free to do whatever you want, independent of God. Whether some people are, whether they believe in God or they don't believe in, in, in God, they still believe that they have absolute free will independent of God, whether he created it or not makes no difference, but they're free. They can do with their will, whatever they want, good or bad, and absolutely free with, with whatever they can do. If, they, if it's there, they can, if they can do it, then that's their own choice. They own it entirely. The other school about this is predestinarianism. Predestinarianism means that you're predestined entirely by God or by a bigger power. And therefore, whatever you do is actually his decree. You're manifesting his decree upon you with absolutely no choice there for you. You are nothing. You're just a robot. You're an instrument through which the decree of the creator uh, manifests itself. Those are two schools. And the Maturidi scholars and uh, um, yeah, I mean, many of the Sunnah scholars, if not almost uh, uh, the majority, uh, they look at the whole thing as between both, between absolute free will and between predestinarianism. And if I want to call it a term that's not in our books, but at Tamkim al ikhtiyar that's closer to the Maturidi understanding, obviously, and uh, the Hanafi understanding, meaning enablement of choice. So between absolute free will, that's independent of God, and predestinarianism, that is where you have no will, but you're manifesting the will of God uh, uh, there is the enablement of choice. And the enablement of choice gives us the understanding. Number one, uh, well, you're enabled to make a choice. So that takes out predestinarianism or absolute predestinarianism out entirely because you're enabled to make a choice. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ Allah says, which means Allah does not change the state of the of people until they change their own state. Another ayah. And your will will not be executed unless Allah wills for it to be. And that gives us an understanding that the enablement of choice or at them is between predestinarianism and and free will so it's in the middle and that means that the human being is enabled to make a choice whether that choice is good or evil that enablement is by the creator of the human being that enablement of choice also is not absolutely free because the sovereignty of god is still over it Yet it allows it by the wisdom, by the eternal wisdom of the creator. He allowed us, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to exercise the enablement of choice uh, as per his decree when he said, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا Subhanahu wa ta'ala وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا and the meaning of the verse, the nafs, and who created the nafs. He enabled the nafs to be wicked or to be pious. Both enabled that nafs to do the worst and to do the best. Right? And whoever purifies it, does Tazkiya, will uh, 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 be successful. Whoever does not purify it and succumbs to the lower nafs desires, 
will stoop to its lowest. That's the basic Islamic premise based on the Quran. What Allah Azza wa Jal, the nafs that Allah made, alhamaha fujuraha wa taqwaha, Allah says in another ayah, وَهَدَيْنَاهُ النَّجْدَيْنِ إِمَّا شَاكِرًا وَإِمَّا كَفُورًا And we've led him or we've enabled him to take, to tread the two paths or the two roads. The road of being shakir, of being thankful and grateful, and the road of وَإِمَّا kafura, and the road of being kafir, which means ungrateful, right? So grateful or ungrateful and then that come, brings us because this important is very this point is very important because it brings us to the premise of the whole issue here that the human being from an islamic perspective uh, is enabled has an enablement of choice with that enablement of choice one can do good one is also enabled to do evil now i want to say Furthermore, the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his generosity and kindness and mercy and love, did not just leave us only with our enablement of choice, which would have been fair and just. No, but he actually sent us messengers and he sent messages. Uh, and those messengers and those messages, thousands of them, they have always tried to give us extra guidance and he also guided us and showed us guidance privately sometimes sometimes meaning experience personal experience sometimes and other issues as well at, at times through science through God, through uh, personal experiences through 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 so many things other than just the messages the messages and the messengers and so he subhanahu wa ta'ala offered us so many ways to lead us to qad aflaha man tazakka successful is the one who does who takes the higher road uh, and loser is the one who takes the selfish uh, road so these things uh, are a basic premise to understand why is there evil uh, similarly, also, since we are, um, I am enabled of uh, making a choice, the enablement of choice, to whether it's good or bad, that also means every other human being is also, that's accountable, is also enabled of making a choice. And therefore, that by itself, you can see how it's very complex because things overlap. I don't live on my own in this globe. I can do, I am responsible for my own evil doing if I do evil, but uh, other people's evil doing also affect me though I am not responsible for initiating them. They are, but because we live in the same place, there's that complexity of lots of evil happening. In life where good is to be accomplished, what Islam teaches us, obviously, there must be enablement of choice, right? So the enablement of choice, rather than free will, because an absolute free will is a Mu'tazili view, and predestinarianism is a Qadari view, and Ahl Sunnah are in between. So the, and the enablement of choice, let's say it's a term I came up with, but it's mirrored uh, in the Hanafi views, obviously, at Tamkin al uh, when If there's good to be attained and accomplished and achieved, there must be enablement of choice. In fact, the whole idea of morality and religion, religion presupposes the existence of the enablement of choice. Meaning, Allah tells us in the Quran, La ikraha fiddin. Uh, and la ikraha fiddin means there is no compulsion in the religion. There is no coercion in the religion. And that means when I choose religion, it must be out of my absolute own choice. If it's forced upon me, it's no longer religion in, in the Islamic view. Therefore, the very question of religion 
presupposes the existence of the enablement of choice, whether to accept it or to reject it. And that's why al Quran Kareem, Allah tells us, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, Waqul al Hakkum al Rabbikum, Faman Sha'a fal Yu'min, Waman Sha'a fal Yakfur. And which means, Haq uh, is from your Lord. Uh, whoever wants shall wants to believe, let him believe or her believe. And who, or whoever does not want, who wants to do kufr, let them do kufr. And that tells you again the enablement of choice that Allah Azza wa Jal gave uh, to all. Enablement of choice is not only uh, is not only to do what is right, uh, because if it's only to do what's good and what's right. It's not enablement. It becomes a mechanical coercion. Uh, a being incapable of wrong equals a being incapable of right, uh, principally speaking. So he or she is not a human being, but an autom automaton. It's a machine. Can do right. Can only do. Can can do wrong. Can only do right. And they, that would not there would be no test there's no accountability there's right the whole point the whole issue of this dimension becomes meaningless and therefore it is from the misuse of these of this enablement of choice that the gloomy shadow of moral evil and physical evil appears uh, uh, both of them or appear uh, the necessity of the enablement of choice obviously justifies accountability in fiqh what we call taklif you're an accountable person simply because you're enabled to have a choice good or bad otherwise you know accounting you of doing wrong while you haven't done it it was forced upon you would be unjust and rewarding you also but accounting you is even more and therefore, taklif rests on the necessity or uh, on the enablement of choice. Uh, and that's why Al Quran al Kareem says, When Afsin wa masawaha fal hamaha fujuraha wa taqwaha, kad aflaha man zakaha wa kad khab lost, or loser is the one who doesn't purify it. Uh, so while the enablement of choice justifies accountability and taklif, it also brings the possibility and the practical inevitability of evil doing, whether it's moral or physical evil. Now, there's a point here that we need to pay attention to, which is the deceit of knowledge, especially when we have, and obviously this works on today's environment, obviously, with all the claims of knowledge and information and whatever it is. Uh, the deceit of knowledge, if we mean by knowledge information, could be a shaitani deceit. For shaitan, in our view, had all the information needed, but what was lacking is transformation, not information. Most of the evil, similarly, I'm making a case here and connecting it to the evil. Most of the evils in the world nowadays could be eliminated if knowledge was the only element needed if information was the only element needed, but that's not how it is. We all know that there's enough for all in this world. So by this, we could conquer poverty, but we don't. Information by itself is insufficient. We all know that we have enough knowledge in this world that if we combine our efforts and work together, we could wipe out or severely reduce almost all plagues and crazy illnesses, but we don't. We all know that if we utilize the financial, scientific, and uh, 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 academic and other efforts spent on wars and violent conflicts in this world, we could have a decent living conditions uh, or decent living conditions for all, but we don't. The challenge, however, does not lie here, obviously, the meaning in the information. The challenge lies 
in, in having information. Uh, the challenge lies in selfishness, envy, greed, and the unregulated lust for power and the love for lower nafs pleasures that drive us all if we're not refined. And refining, believe you me, uh, in general, takes decades, not just years, in general, uh, with a track record. In, in a word, uh, it is the evil uh, doing of human beings that is the source of our ills, uh, much and much of our unhappiness uh, due to the misuse of enablement. Yet if accountability before God and spiritual elimination, illumination is to be achieved, uh, the enablement of choice must be preserved. Uh, how can we be spiritual, spiritually illuminated and accountable before God and we didn't have a choice? Um, just as a, uh, uh, as a, 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 a child, does not learn to walk properly without the possibility of falling, the human being cannot reach illumination and maximize his or her maximum potential, spiritually speaking, without the possibility of going wrong. The least to say, the theoretical possibility to, to uh, go wrong. In short, the enablement of choice that Allah gave us to do good or evil though it involves grievous errors and pain is the very condition of our being accountable and illuminated human beings. Uh, generally, uh, there is no other way for men and women to vindicate the moral order and spiritual illumination. Uh, we cannot have it both ways, a world where the horror of war, injustices, slavery, and exploitation of the weak happen, the learning of self-sacrifice, fellowship, selflessness, generosity, and chivalry, chivalry will also happen. Indeed, if God were to overturn the possibility of evil, the whole point of accountability, enablement of choice, choice itself and illumination would be almost meaningless. A world tailored for the achievement of life and illumination must be one of order. That's very important. A world, meaning this world is not chaos rather than cosmos. Cosmos, it's an orderly world. It's not chaotic world. Allah says, So a world that's tailored for achievement and illumination must be one of order. And this order ought to be the universal order, consistent order, a reliable order. And this order also means that all things have their own specific nature that the creator natured them with and behave according to his eternal will and, and in consistency with their nature. Uh, for example, uh, the specific nature and behavior are, of water, for instance, uh, 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 gives irrigates fertile soil, gives us pleasant streams, uh, generates beautiful climate and gives power to the human being's use. We do lots of things with that running water from elect generating electricity to other things. And indeed, the very existence of life is from water. That's the nature of water. All right. And it, that's how it behaves, the behavior of water. And we have to understand also at the same time, the inevitability of water may mean tornadoes, may mean floods, may mean tsunamis, and may mean destruction in which the good suffers with the evil. 
the uh, importance that we understand when we talk about this universal order that the creator subhanahu wa ta'ala made or created uh, this universal order is essential uh, uh, for a moral world anyway it's a solid foundation upon which moral achievements can be built if our world again were a chaos rather than cosmos and if we never knew within reasonable limits uh, what was going to happen next our lives would be uh, chaotic and 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 meaningless in one way not merely because it would be unpleasant but it's just meaningless morally speaking if there was no order in the world uh, reason could not develop in the human being we would not have reason uh, for the human being's reason develops in response to the order that it want, that it sees or it observes in our universe without this order science itself could not be possible for science is simply the discovery of this order that the creator subhanahu wa ta'ala will to have and it's setting forth in terms of what we call natural laws and the order of this creation uh, this order while it permits obviously is the order the creation that allah Azzawajal said in allah وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ While this, this order and this creation, this universal order and this creation, while it permits certain evil, it may permit, let me put it this way, because uh, the human being or the creation is never sovereign. So while this universal order, uh, while it may permit certain evil to happen at the same time or at the same token, makes possible for their overcoming so that destructive floods may be part of the order of nature let's say if we're talking about nature but knowledge of the same order of nature makes it possible to halt forest destruction impound waters and change the process from destruction to construction and now we can see that the gains of an orderly universe where the enablement of choice is there to do good or evil far outweighs the losses. The possibility of evil is part of the existence of our creation while the existence of this creation is necessary for the achievement of a higher life. Uh, or an illuminated life. Um, so if th this is how I, uh, in it, I want to talk about the basics of the whole question. So we understand uh, why, why evil uh, is there. Now, Islam gives us few ways to sort of understand. Now, this is the basic. There's no change to that or the foundation. But Islam gives us few ways to understand and benefit from the inevitable evil, to turn the, uh, 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 the, the sin into a win, if you may say so, or to turn it into an opportunity, um, right? And first is the uh, understanding that uh, evil results from uh, the human misuse of the enablement of choice. Uh, the consequences of evil is beyond the self. And that's something Al-Quran Kareem tells us. It creates, it causes, I don't want to use the word create so we don't get confused. It causes an imbalance, not just in you, but also around you and also in the world. And that's why Al-Quran Kareem says, ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس. Corruption uh, surfaced on land and in the sea because of as a consequence of what people 
of the of the evil that people do. So there seems to be an imbalance that's created or that's done by when evil is done, not only that is within the self, spiritually in other ways, but also around you and also far beyond. And that's why Al-Quran Al-Kareem says, And be, uh, be conscious of a test if you do evil that will not just harm those who have done evil only, because you're part of this world and Al-Quran Al-Kareem asked you, fiha, asked you to build this world, to construct it, meaning to contribute positively to it, not to contribute negatively to it. And by doing evil, you're contributing negatively, not just to yourself, but to everything around you. And this is on a moral and physical evil uh, level, right? So uh, 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 there, uh, uh, there's evil also then, that we control by our enablement of choice and there's evil we can't control because others are also empowered of enablement of choice or they're enabled to make a choice. And therefore, I can't control the evil that's coming from them. Uh, initially speaking, I can try to fend it off as much as I can, but you see how the complex situation, just to help us understand further, what, the, what all that means. Also, from another angle that Al-Quran gives us, uh, again, not as a purpose or an objective for evil, but as an understanding that prosperity follows goodness and righteousness. If you believe in Allah, that's the only way. And if you believe in yourself or you make yourself self-God or your desires self, you know, are God for you, as Allah says, or your greed and lust for different things uh, make you worship that, you won't see that. Prosperity follows goodness and righteousness, while suffering follows sins and evil. That's how, uh, in general, Al-Quran, Al-Kareem, uh, gives us in general again and that's not just individual remember because you're not the only one who's enabled to do evil that's also what that's also for all those who do evil that are, who are enabled and misuse that enablement and therefore from a, 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 a personal level one must be careful not to consider this as a punishment from God necessarily but it's a natural consequence to causing an imbalance in the world when prosperity follows goodness and suffering follows, follows evil. That's not necessarily, oftentimes people say when something happens, it's the punishment of God. It's a natural consequence that is built in this order that the creator created the universe with. Islam, while viewing the validating, the validating of consequences for evil and good, does not believe that doing evil nor its consequences are desirable, nor are they a purpose in and of themselves. Nor do we view that uh, punishment is a solution of the problem of evil, of evil. Rather, Muslims view it as a consequence. A punishment is a consequence rather than a solution. And, and that's also very important to understand. Islam also shows us that we can turn evil into an opportunity. I'm, I'm finishing soon, but just give me a couple of minutes, inshallah. That we can turn evil into an opportunity. And the non-moral evils have a benefit of being disciplinary rather than penal. Uh, he, here, evil helps to reform or to test rather than to punish. That's another sort of aspect or dimension we look at the evil that's happening. Again, this is not a purpose for evil. That's not what Muslims believe. But it's an opportunity that we can benefit from the inevitable evil anyway. So even people of no faith, cannot deny that
that many apparent evils turn out in the end to be goods in disguise. In disguise, it's, it's actually good. Uh, character may be refined out of hardship. Unfortunate her hereditary and environmental conditions may yield resentful, depressed, and hopeless people. But oftentimes, they've also yielded a, a divine orient or led to a, or were blessed by divine orientation that, can, that makes uh, great and noble characters. Suffering may be painful, obviously, and may uh, go on ignored, but to the illuminated and enlightened nafs, it teaches also lots of sympathy. And you see that in people who also, and many people who suffered. Again, this is not the purpose of it, but this is an aspect that we can see uh, uh, and we can benefit from to turn it to turn evil, the inevitable evil anyway, into actually an opportunity of refinement and learning and illumination. And that's the point of the struggle. Again, here Islam tries to focus us to turn evil into an opportunity uh, and also to play less the claim of victimhood and to move into uh, agency rather than victim. And the reason for that, because we understand since evil is inevitable due to the misuse of the enablement of choice, it's going to be there. We either sit and play victim or we move into agency. And the Quran is telling us there is an aspect you can use oftentimes, not necessarily all the time, into becoming agency and, uh, and improving the situation. Another view also that uh, scholarship, Muslim scholarship gives us also from the inevitable evil is to view evil as an incomplete part of good. Yani the point here is that the true is the whole and the partial of anything is deficient and irrational. Many blotches of color within a painting are ugly, but the painting as a whole is beautiful. Now, sometimes we don't understand when we look at the partial because the time, we don't have all the time frame. Allah did not give us timeless lives yet, meaning our souls are timeless, but this dimension is not timeless. And we don't see everything. We don't know all the dimensions of life and of everything that we do and the, and the consequences. We were, we're told, but we don't see it. So if there's no faith, it becomes only blotches and it may be ugly. And um, it, 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 this is not to say, and I'm not trying to say in any way, nor did Islam say in any way <clears throat> about this that this means that destructive means justify constructive ends. Absolutely not, <clears throat> because Al Quran Karim insists whoever does an atom worth of evil shall see it an atom worth, and whoever does an atom worth of good shall see it. But a, 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 a maybe from a spiritual aspect, looking at it. Uh, like, like I said, the many blotches of color within a painting uh, may look ugly if you look at them this way, but the painting as a whole looks beautiful. Um, also, <clears throat> another aspect from a theological perspective and from sometimes a spiritual perspective as well is that the inevitable evil that happens due to the misuse of the enablement of choice by us and others helps in the fact that it becomes a contrast to good. Not that it is needed to have to understand the good and the need to do good. No, it's not needed. But because it's in because of its inevitability, it helps the doubtful see better. It helps the blind see clearer. 
appreciating the goodness is much more enhanced in the face of evil for those who don't see, for those who are blind hearted or blind sighted. And because for to those who can't see, whether to due to spiritual blindness or to intellectual blindness, whatever or both, if all were good, goodness could not be defined clearly to them. They like to see a contrast. And um, uh, again, it's not that evil becomes essential to the beauty of the good, nor does evil contribute to its perfection. Good is already beautiful and perfection, but it helps those who are blinded oftentimes to see better. So um, I, the question is really, the, to be honest with you, the, uh, the, the whole uh, topic is uh, very theological in nature first and then spiritual. And uh, it's, um, uh, it, it doesn't suffice to give it just a word, uh, an hour to talk about it and all that. So, uh, but I hope that uh, the foundation uh, is laid and uh, from there, inshallah, I hope that benefits more. Obviously, uh, uh, it needs to go further more, inshallah ta'ala. Maybe some other time. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alih. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamualaikum, Shaykh. Wa alaikum salam. Inshallah, uh, a very insightful and uh, I would say profound uh, lecture by you. Lots of knowledge and uh, lots of different knowledge sciences that we learned today. Mashallah, thank you very much for it. And Alhamdulillah, as I mentioned, we have a Q&A session right now. And uh, we have quite a number of interesting questions pertaining to the topic uh, that I will address to you now. Inshallah. Uh, Shay, uh, the first question, <clears throat> are humans uh, innately good or innately <clears throat> bad? Do we naturally gravitate, gravitate towards good more or the bad? Or it is neutral when we were first born? Yeah, yeah Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yeah, if you are listening to uh, what I was saying, uh, the enablement of choice uh, obviously means that we were born on the fitra, and the fitra is the absolute capacity to do good or evil, and we're enabled to do so. But the creator did not leave you just with basic enablement and 50-50, no. He sent you messages, and he sent you books, and he sent you messengers, and prophets, and signs within you and outside of you, all to guide you to take the right choice and to do the right thing. So. Uh, yes, that's. I think that's the answer at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is: If we see those who commit great evil, like abuse or murder, it often comes from a cycle of abuse. So it is harder for those who witness abuse, since he is a child, to become a good person, compared to someone who has a good role model and a good childhood. How do you help such a person who has not seen much good in their life and have witnessed, and have witnessed a lot of suffering and that's all they have seen? Yeah. So this is speaking about the, uh, the human being being a product of their environment. Yeah. And that's what the Prophet wasallam told us in hadith Sahih Muslim, كُلُّ مَوْلُودًا يُلَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ فَأَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِهِ وَإِنْ كَانَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ فَمُسْلِمْ Every newborn is born on the fitrah. An absolute, clear, no original sin, but original good. Let's put it this way. Not original sin, but original good. And 
uh, his parents or meaning his environment makes him a Yahudi, a Nasrani or a Muslim. Basically, whatever the environment is, the human being grows in that. Well, that's why Islam asked us not to be Salih only, but to be Muslih. Meaning Salih means reformed. Muslih means reforming. And uh, it's the collective duty of all of us when Allah says, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَىٰ وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ فِي سورة الْمَائِدَةِ And you should cooperate with each other. Enjoin doing the good and do not do evil. And that's again, so therefore, we're, there's an individual responsibility here and there's also a collective responsibility onto society. So both these things uh, play in hand. Allah, Shay, thank you very much. Uh, the next question, Shay, is how do you come out of poverty based on the Quran? Well, Islam looks at poverty as the Prophet وسلم, said in the authentic hadith, Muslim, الْغِنَى غِنَى لَيْسَ الْغِنَى عَنْ كَثْرَةِ الْعَرَضِ Wealth, the wealthy is not the one the prophetic hadith is telling us the wealthy is not the one who has the most, but the one who needs the least. If you have needs, you're poor. Allah. And the more you need, the more poor you are. So Islam doesn't tell, now that has nothing to do with you, with the opportunity out there, whether it's through skills, education and opportunity, obviously, or grace purely, to go and become rich, uh, materialistically speaking, you can do that. It's open for you. You seek uh, the right ways, the legal ways, the proper ways, the halal ways, and you may be able to do so. But that's not characterized as wealthy in Islam. Uh, and even for that, Islam doesn't want you to have wealth in your heart. It's, Islam wants you to keep wealth down in your pocket. So, yeah. in both ways, now. Mashallah. Thank you, Shay. Uh, the next question is about, um, dear Shay, any advice on how to reduce personal sins and how to soften our hearts if we feel that our hearts are hardened? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You know, this is the old question, the old and the new question. And today in our world, unfortunately, we are, uh, it's, it's the, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us in some of the hadith, these are the eras of deceit. And deceit is when you look at something and you think it is what it is, but because it's of its presentation, not of its reality. And the only way I think to return back to doing more good is to return back to our blueprint. And our bl blueprint is found in the book of Allah, which he revealed. This is the blueprint that has the human being and it, it speaks to the human being. And in times of confusion and in times of charlatans, and in times of deceit, and in times of all that stuff that's out there, and in times of the emergence of all people who are have the lust for power and 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 selfishness and uh, <clears throat> and all that and greed and and all it the time is to go back to the Quran itself and try to sort of build a connection with it. The Quran itself is guiding. So take the light of the Quran and because there is a message for you there and go to the uncontested authentic prophetic sunnah. The uncontested authentic prophetic sunnah, take the light from the Prophet wasallam, and try to be close to that. Don't ever take a figure as a benchmark for the book and the sunnah. The book and the authentic prophetic sunnah is the benchmark for all. It's the umbrella for all, over all in that sense. So 
always go there and you'll find calmness and peace and tranquility with, uh, with the book of Allah. And look, look for the book in the book of Allah for all the dua where Allah says, Rabbi. Why is he telling you that? Yani, why is he telling you that on behalf of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam alladhi waffa or on behalf of Dawood alayhi salatu was salam or on behalf of Isa alayhi salatu was salam or on behalf of uh, other anbiya alayhi salatu was salam why you can actually take those adiyya or those dua from the Quran and repeat it yourself so look for those and be in the dhikr the Quranic dhikr the Quranic dhikr that Allah gives and whenever you see Rabbi or Rabbana, that's a message for you. Take it and keep going through it. MashaAllah. Thank you, Shay. What a beautiful way you explain. SubhanAllah. Uh, Shay, just now you also mentioned about tsunami and natural disaster, right? So when our, our natural disaster affect a group of people, some will say that this is because of the evil. You mentioned not necessarily evil punishment from Allah just now. They are done. What the appropriate way to look at this as uh, for children? Because sometimes you need to inform them that, you know, God is merciful. But at the same time, you need to tell them, on the other hand, God is Jalal also, right? And uh, so is there, we can find wisdom for children to understand this sort of situation. Like I said, we have to tell children about the nature of the creation and its qualities that Allah created it with, just like water is needed for us to drink, to drink it and need it for plants to grow and need it for beautiful streams to uh, manifest. Water can also have the inevitability of causing floods and destruction and all that. We need to tell people that peace and comfort is not in the beautiful creation, but in the beautiful, yani al jamil in that sense, creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That rests, rest is not with the creation, but rest is with the creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the creation is volatile and variable, and the creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is all giving. And that this life and this dimension is actually a test. It's not an everlasting abode. And because of the nature of this, of the of the order of this universe, of the creation, uh, things that happen to it, uh, things that happen in it, uh, have a wisdom or a, a, a there's a bigger picture, but we don't always see that bigger picture simply because of our time time limited frame uh, capacity frame epistemology of the existence and wisdom and knowledge of the human being and all these things and we tell them that true life is being close to the creator of life not being close to life itself life itself is incapable ages incapacitated weak and does not provide a source of comfort. The creator is the one who is mighty and capable, or I'm sorry, it's not for land, capable, uh, 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 mighty and, and, uh, uh, and gives and grants, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, thank you, Shay. The next question is, how do we hold on to Allah and not on creation and dunya? I just answered that. In... <laughs> Yeah, sorry. I just answered that because if you think the creation is the source of happiness, of help or happiness, yeah. the creation is itself is is incapable. The creation, it's, if you draw your strength from the creation, mm -hmm. Allah says, "Khuliq al insanu da'ifa," the human being is created weak. You are weak, and you're trying to rely on a weak. The sought and the seeker both lose. Seek help from him who empowers the weak. And with him, no matter what happens in this volatile life and is in his very in varying 
circumstance of life, if you're with him, you're always on the winning side. You're always on the tranquility side. You're always on the happy side, irrespective of what happens in life here. Ala inna awliya Allah. Did Allah say in the Quran about the awliya Allah? Uh, there is no labtila alayhim. There is no abtila. There is no test on them. Or he says la khawfun alayhim. He says la khawfun alayhim. Walahum yahzanun. There is no sad or sorrow that befalls them. He didn't say there are no tests that will befall them, but they're not subject. Happy they are, content they are, peaceful they are. And that's where the Quran leads us to, to this spiritual direction. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Shay. Uh, mashallah. The, the next question is uh, some people do a lot of good in their lives. But somehow they fall back into bad deeds again and again. Can you explain why the nafs is that way? And how can we protect ourselves from falling back into our old bad habits? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to the world of the human being. <laughs> Welcome to the struggle. So long you're struggling, that's good. Meaning you caught yourself that you're doing wrong. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, that's a great thing uh, because in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ And when they're told, do not commit evil on earth, قَالُوا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُصْلِحُونَ They say, but we are but reformers, we do good. Allah says, Ala innahum humul mufsidun, walakin la yashurun. They are indeed the ones who do evil and corruption, but they lost the feeling. They don't even know that they're doing evil. So when we catch ourselves, and the reason we catch ourselves is because, again, we are enabled. We go back to the enablement of choice. Since we're enabled to do good or evil, uh, and that's part of this universal order. Then we're going to be able to do good, and sometimes we're going to be we're going to do also evil. The struggle is how do we catch ourselves from doing evil and do more good? And then there's ways to neutralize or to improve or uh, 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 do good with that evil. Catching ourselves doing evil it means that's good, especially if we catch not just know that we're doing evil and we don't do anything about it. And so that still means that the heart is awake and that's good, it's not dead yet. The problem is when the heart dies, that's a real problem. But when so long the heart is able to tell that we're doing evil and stops us from continuing to do evil, that's a good sign. That's a sign, that's a good sign of recovery. And how do we do that? Well, there's many things. Number one, Get out of the environment that leads you to do evil, whether it's people or things. Get out of that. Because as you all know, uh, company always pulls you towards its direction. That's normal. And uh, uh, if we don't understand that, uh, we, we will always lose uh, w with this. So uh, please... Uh, look for things that make you uh, uh, fall, for whether, whether it is, let's say, certain people, whether it's yourself only by yourself. Occupy yourself, change your time, your habits, your things, so you occupy yourself with good. Because like Ibn Ata says, Rahimahullah, Nafsak in lam tashghalha bil haq, shagalatka bil batal. And this is a rule. If you don't occupy your nafs with good, it will occupy you with evil. You are not just what you eat. You are who you meet. If you meet people who have a certain trend towards things, that's who you are. That's where my uncle Sayyid Saeed, rahmatullahi alayh, used to say, as-sahib sahib. You are who you meet. Not who are you, who you eat only. Who you meet defines you eventually. 
So be careful of that. And it may be just you, your lower nafs desires, you meet them, will make sure you meet your upper nafs desires, your higher aspiration in your nafs. So that, that's something that's very important. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Shin, the next question is from someone who is asking about praying kushu. But at the same time, you are facing the biggest tribulations in your life. Like, for example, this person is going through divorce. But at the same time, he really wants to be in kushu, in prayer. Because he said that whenever he pray, his mind is all over the place. So can you advise what to do and what to read, uh, you know? I mean, look, uh, uh, people go through turbulations and turbulations are relative, relative. Uh, you know, uh, some people, uh, one thing uh, uh, it takes over their whole being. And what's important is to put this whole life in perspective rather than to aggrandize life and its components but to put it in perspective and perspective of this life, it's limited. It is not an abode of permanent happiness because if you're looking for permanent happiness in this world, you got the wrong address. It, that, that's Jannah. Jannah is the place for everlasting peace and happiness. This is a place of struggle. And this is a place where you will actually also reap the reward or the consequences of what you do. And unfortunately, you'll also be affected by what other people do, good or bad. The best, that's where the Quran comes and gives you the roadmap. How do I come out of it as safe as possible, as, uh, as, as good as possible? And with that, obviously, one tries to do the best they can. And sometimes still, uh, evil is inevitable. So one tries to mitigate that as much as they can by number one, uh, turning away from the source that's robbing them from their tranquility and their spirituality to the source that actually gives them that tranquility and spirituality. And there's no other source like that than the Quran itself. And then the living in the light, in the shade of the prophetic sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Draw strength from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yani, when we look at our lives with all the respect, uh, no matter what we, what, how many things can go wrong in people's life. And you don't want me to go through the prophetic seerah, right? At this point, Khaled, we're already late in the game. Uh, and it's almost yeah. 11 p.m. your time in Singapore. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. No but worry. but, but uh, the Prophet وسلم, before he was born, Allah took his father away. Right after he was born, shortly after he was born, he took his mother away. Then when his, when his, uh, when his uh, grandfather takes him, Allah takes his, his grandfather away. And then he, he, because his father is no longer there, he doesn't have the money that his father had because it goes to the older brothers in the tribes, as you all know. So he grows up poor without any money, though he's from the master family in Quraysh. He goes and becomes a shepherd, the son of the master or the son of the grand master of Mecca and the entire peninsula becomes a shepherd. You think you have it rough or we think we have it rough. Then he gets married وسلم, to our mother Khadija. Then he has children from her and he buries his own children before they become one, one after the other. Then he buries his own wife, Khadija, with his own with his own hand. Then his own uncle who protects him for 15 years and more, who helped Islam be protected and the prophet of Islam be protected, he dies and he, he, he also buries him also. He, uh, let's, uh, his own companions that helped and, st and stood and all this, he sees them getting killed and getting betrayed and by deceit. Look, life is a struggle. There are lots of beautiful things in it, that's for sure. And the beauty in it is being close to the right side of it. And the right side is that, mm -hmm. is the roadmap that the creator of all showed us. And that's where you have the book and the sunnah. 
Thank you, Saidi. Uh, this is the last question, Saidi, and it's pertaining to suicide. I think this person uh, uh, trying to find the wisdom behind it. Right? He said uh, something like, why does Allah allow a soul into a body when he knew in the end that this person will die uh, in a suicide? Well, first of all, it's always unfortunate when these things happen. And again, this is uh, the question of why does Allah uh, wrong things to happen is because he allows the right things to happen and he guided us he guides us to do the right things and and sometimes we make the wrong choices like sometimes we make the right choices and we're encouraged to make the right and avoid the wrong that's for sure uh, but we look at this also as an event of unfortunate unfortunate event and also of let's say a weakness in the person so weak to have figured that the only way is to take their own lives. So that's a point of weakness, not a point of strength. And it's a point where help and guidance is required uh, beforehand, obviously, rather than, uh, for example, just sit and condemn the, the point I said of responsibility is not just individual, it's also collective. وَلْتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةً Allah says, let there be, let, let, let you be a nation who call towards good. And therefore, failures like this are not always individual failures. Oftentimes, there's a huge component of collective failure as well. Wallahu a'lam. Thank you, Sayyidi. MashaAllah, may Allah preserve you. Thank you for uh, your wisdom, your knowledge, and your time and your dedication. MashaAllah, we benefit a lot tonight. Before we end this uh, online dars with you, uh, we like to seek your dua. Closing dua. Um, Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين اللهم إن صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد أمين. كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم أمين. وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم إني عبدك ابن عبدك ابن أمتك ناصيتي بيدك ماض في حكمك عدل في قضاءك أسألك بكل اسم هو لك سميت به نفسك أو أنزلته في كتابك أو علمته أحد أحدا من خلقك أو استأثرت به في علم الغيب عندك أن تجعل القرآن العظيم ربيع قلوبنا ونور صدورنا وجلاء أحزاننا وذهاب همومنا وغمومنا اللهم رب السماوات السبع وما أظلت ورب الأراضين وما أقلت ورب الشياطين وما أضلت كن لنا جارا من شر خلقك كلهم جميعا أن يفرط علي أحدهم أو أن يبغى عز جارك وجل ثناؤك ولا إله غيرك أعوذ بكلماتك التامات يا رب من غضبك وعقابك وشر عبادك ومن همسات الشياطين رب لا تكلنا إلى أحد ولا ولا واغننا يا ربنا عن كل احد يا من اليه المستند وعليه المعتمد وهو الواحد الفرد الصمد لا شريك لك ولا ولد سبحانك خذ بيدي يا رب وبيد احبابي واخواني من الضلال الى الى الرشد ونجنا ربنا من كل ضيق ونكد اللهم اني اسالك بموجبات رحمتك وعزائم مغفرتك اللهم إني أسألك موجبات رحمتك وعزائم مغفرتك والغنيمة من كل بر 
والسلامة من كل إثم والفوز برضاك والجنة والنجاة من غضبك والنار يا عزيز يا كريم يا غفار لا تدع إلا هم لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة هي لك رضا ولنا فيها نفع إلا قضيتها برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إنا نسألك أن تفرغ علينا صبرا وتتوفنا مسلمين وتلحقنا بالصالحين وتفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وحسب الله ونعم الوكيل اللهم إني أسألك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم الذي إذا دعيت به أجبت وإذا سئلت به أعطيت وإذا استرحمت به رحمت وإذا استفرجت به فرجت أن تفرج عنا يا ربنا ما نحن فيه وأن تكفنا شر الحاسدين والمعادين يا, يا رب العالمين وانصرنا عليهم بنصرك وتأييدك يا قوي يا معين اللهم لا تكلنا إلى أنفسنا طرفة عين ولا أقل من ذلك ولا أكثر يا رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الحبيب الأعظم المحبوب الأكرم صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وأزواجه وذرياته وأصحابه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا ومحمد وآله صلاة ترضيك وترضيه وترضى بها عنا يا رب العالمين اغفر اللهم لنا ولوالدينا ومشايفنا ولمن له حق علينا ولمن على الخير أعاننا وعن الشر أبعدنا أمين. اللهم يا ربنا اجمعنا على ما يرضيك جنبنا معاصيك اجعلنا ربنا من المتحابين فيه ربنا إن نعوذ برضاك من سخطك وبمعافاتك من عقوبتك وبك منك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين Thank you very much Sheikh, for your time and everything that you had done for us tonight. May Allah preserve you and we hope to see you in Singapore, inshallah, after all this pandemic. May Allah bring you to Singapore and we share the blessing with you, inshallah. See you again, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Shukran to you. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, another session, interesting session with Nadir Han and also on Saturday with uh, Sister Aisha Gray. Uh, at Fonz Vite, both at 9 p.m. So catch us on Sweet Ilahi FB. See you. Assalamualaikum.